This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. That's right, your weekly stop for anything and everything related to Georgia agriculture. Hi everybody, so glad you could join us for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. We've got a lot to get to on today's show. Coming up, if you're planning to attend this year's AFBF meeting in San Diego, expect some major changes. We'll tell you what they are and why American Farm Bureau says they're for the better. Also, meet the first of three finalists for this year's Georgia Farm Bureau Young Farmer Achievement Award, Drew and Shelley Eccles of J. Moore Farms. And then later, they are intimidating, frightening, some would even say downright hideous. However, when it comes to bats, they are actually a farmer's best friend. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, as you know, many producers have spent the last few weeks harvesting a number of row crops, including soybeans. Recently, I caught up with one farmer in southwest Georgia that told me for him, this year's soybean crop will be very strong. If you drive across the clay and Calhoun County lines in South Georgia, you'll see beautiful golden fields. That's because of the soybeans. And you'll find Chad Brooks busy combining the soybeans. Said he feels pretty positive about what he sees. The yield on the beans is good. It's all the beans we plant here. Uh, like I said, located in Calhoun County, Edison, Georgia. Uh, plant group seven beans behind wheat double cropped. And for this year, that's been the best as far as the margins, net margins versus because peanut prices are depressed. Cotton price is very depressed, corn, instead of getting into all that other. So actually our best profit margin this year has been wheat beans. And the yields right now have been running. We have some other beans in fields running 70 bushels, but these here behind me, 85 bushel beans. Despite the challenging dry weather this year, Brooks said they stuck with it and their hard work seems to be paying off. Plus, he's added two new combines. Yes, sir, both combines are new ones. Uh, um, both, well, both of them actually 2013 models. Case combines, you can't get any better as far as harvesting grain. Once the beans are loaded and delivered, Brooks told me he's hoping for a good price at market. I believe wheat and beans going to be a big crop for everybody, but that's not, for us, that's unusual. We don't plant many beans because, as you know, they're a legume. Peanuts have always been our bread and butter, so we got to watch it and be careful with our rotation. At the Georgia Farm Bureau offices in Macon, Joe McManus and Taylor Seals, both grain specialists, are constantly searching the prices. The Grain Desk is a service the Farm Bureau provides to its members to help them on the farm. Oh, uh, you know, for the when the when the year first started, the marketing year started, you know, things were almost at record lows, but with rail values coming out of the Midwest uh, skyrocketing due to the oil crisis, um, and you know the stock market being a little crazy lately. We've seen a pretty good little rise in grain and oilseed prices, and we've, you know, we've, we're here to help our farmers maximize that potential. Farmers like Chad Brooks say they keep diversifying and finding ways to be more efficient. I have some growers this year that had peanuts last year, planted wheat, then we planted beans. Those beans are just as good, but now they're going to need to throw some cotton or corn or something in the rotation for two to three years to get that peanut rotation back or bean rotation. And for all your questions and answers, as well as the latest news regarding soybeans, check out the American Soybean Association website. That is soygrowers.com. You'll also find information there on how to become a member of the ASA. In other ag news now, according to Farm Futures magazine, three counties in Georgia rank amongst the top five best places to farm in the entire U.S. Using census data to calculate countywide financial performance, including return on assets, profit margin, asset turnover, and average net farm income. The magazine ranked Monroe, Macon, and Tattnall County as the third, fourth, and fifth best places to farm, with Yuma County, Arizona checking in at number one. Also making the list was Barrow County, Georgia, which ranks 20th. Meantime, egg consumption is now the highest it's been in seven years. According to the American Egg Board, the industry added nearly four eggs per person per year between 2011 and 2013. The board estimates that when it's all said and done, consumers will have eaten on average 257.9 eggs per person in 2014. Also up significantly, U.S. ag exports. In fact, the USDA has released its final total for this fiscal year, and it's a new world record. 
the final tally, a whopping $152.5 billion. That's with a B. That's an increase of $11.5 billion from last year's record total. U.S. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack saying, quote, U.S. agricultural exports have increased in volume as well as in monetary value, which demonstrates an increasing global appetite for high-quality American-grown products. Georgia pecan producers are out in the orchards around the state gathering up this year's crop. Due to challenging growing conditions, farmers are seeing some mixed results. Yeah, recently the monitor's Mark Wildman visited with one pecan producer who is pleased with his harvest so far but says the crop was very expensive to produce. In Crisp County, Brad Ellis checks on one of his trees and is glad his crop is finally being harvested. He farms multiple orchards in different counties, and this year he and other pecan growers had some very challenging conditions across the state. Well, we've had a, had a lot of rain early, which caused a lot more sprays on a lot of, a lot of varieties. The uh, summer cut off real dry for a couple of months. We had to crank up all the irrigation and uh, really had a late spring uh, stay cool a lot longer, and so the trees, they protect themselves and they waited and uh, it just caused them to be a little bit late. As the machinery runs through this orchard shaking the trees, this farm has seen plenty of pecans, but the weather this year has had an impact on their size. This year it just caused them to be smaller and uh, so we've got a lot smaller. They, they really filled out good because we did have rain, but uh, where everybody get, kept them sprayed, they're real good quality. UGA pecan specialist Lenny Wells tracks every aspect of pecan production in Georgia, and this year location was key to an orchard success. If you're from 280 north, uh, especially in the middle Georgia area, everything looks, looks pretty good. If you go south from there, um, in most cases, the worse the crop gets, especially as you go over into southeast Georgia and down into extreme southwest Georgia, um, we have a lot more issues. This particular orchard is located right on that line between good and not so good. But the farm had to shell out a lot of expense in spraying the crop. And that has been the case for other growers as well. Most growers this year probably were somewhere around 16 sprays, which normally you're looking at around 10 sprays or so. And so that drives the cost up considerably. And I put those numbers together uh, a few months ago, and we were looking at somewhere around fourteen to fifteen hundred dollars an acre. If you were doing ten fungicide sprays, if you do sixteen fungicide sprays, that gets it up to about seventeen hundred dollars per acre. So it's a considerable cost to the grower to have to do that. Still, pecans are in high demand, and prices are good. As these pecans are harvested, they are sent to the Ellis Brothers packing facility, where they are bagged up and sent to China and other markets or are packaged up and sold at their retail store just off I-75 in Vienna. Here, family members closely monitor every aspect of the business to make sure consumers get the high quality product they have come to expect. We kind of attribute that to survival because a lot of farmers that have farmed for the last 20 years kind of went out of business in those, in those lean years, but we were able with the store and, and, and taking them all the way to market a little bit of an advantage. As the holidays approach, families all over the world will be enjoying Georgia pecans, and as they eat their pecan pies, cookies, and candy, they will have no idea the effort and expense that went into getting that product to their tables. Reporting for the Georgia Farm Monitor, I'm Mark Wildman. All right, Mark, great job as always. We'll still to come on the monitor. Take a trip with us to Alto, Georgia, as we profile one of three finalists for the Georgia Farm Bureau's annual Young Farmer Achievement Award. Plus, it's often said that change is good. Will it be the case at this year's AFBF convention? What you can expect in San Diego when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. One third of human food crops need pollinators like honeybees to help them grow. The North American Pollinator Protection Campaign hosted a conference at USDA to talk about the challenges facing pollinators. We can't eliminate all of the stresses on bees and what they're experiencing right now, but we can identify and mitigate some of those stresses. Many projects are underway working on native bees and honeybees to understand these problems, but much more needs to be done. 
Domestic honeybees pollinate approximately $10 billion worth of crops in the U.S. each year. Rain barrels are a way to conserve water, help the environment, and save money. The barrels collect rainwater runoff from rooftops that might otherwise flow into streets and carry pollutants into waterways. That collected water can then be used on gardens, lawns, shrubs, and trees. So whether your motivation is the cost of water or just the health of your plants, a rain barrel may be a valuable addition to your garden. Obviously, the size of your roof and where you live will determine your cost benefits to make it worthwhile. 660 gallons of water can be collected if it rains one inch on a thousand square foot roof. To learn more about rain barrels and other water conservation measures, visit the People's Garden website at USDA.gov. All right, that was Bob Ellison reporting. Thank you so much, Bob. Moving on now, the Georgia Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Program. Now, this is a great way for farmers between the ages of 18 and 35 to network with other producers and learn how to be an advocate for agriculture. Every year, participants are given an opportunity to compete for the Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award and a chance to win some really big prizes. Today, the Monitor profiles the first of three finalists for this year's award. Our interaction with consumers, uh, our customers here, we are uh, again trying to teach them about the industry, uh, the good that's in the industry, and, and teach them, you know, that uh, that farmers are good folks. I'm Drew Eccles from Jaymore Farms. This is my daughter, uh, Chloe Eccles, my son Cohen, and my wife Shelley. Uh, we uh, we own and operate uh, Jaymore Farms with uh, with my family. It's a family-owned partnership. I've grown up on the farm here uh, all my life and uh, just I spent about two and a half years away from the farm uh, in my early 20s at Georgia Power. I, I was you know the whole time I was there I wanted to come back. We had uh, built our name and our reputation on peach production for uh, for almost a hundred years. My, uh, my grandfather's great-granddad actually started the farm and, uh, and I'm actually the, the fifth generation uh, working here at, uh, at J. Moore right now. But I knew that we had to do more than just, uh, just peaches. We, uh, we needed to diversify the operation, get some more crops in the ground. I've never seen any, anyone as passionate about what they do as, as Drew is. He loves it. It's like a drug to him. You know, the more he can do it, the better off he is. So he loves being around. Uh, the, the farm and the market and, and all of that. Um, sometimes it's tough raising a family um, when your husband works as much as Drew does and on the farm, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm not saying we mastered it by any means, but we found some crops that worked and, uh, and we were able to start getting more people in here to, to get the uh, local grown produce. Uh, shortly thereafter, we, uh, the buzzword around the industry was uh, experience your farm. Uh, just let people come out on the farm and, uh, and, and have the experience of getting out there and either having some, uh, some fun on the farm or some kind of educational experience. You know, we're trying to use our crops and our location and destination to bring people out on the farm, let them have a, a good experience, let them uh, learn something about the industry. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, not only are we uh, winning and gaining customers for Jay Moore, but we're, uh, we're changing people's mind ab about the industry. I think I was sitting down in Jekyll a couple years ago at convention. I was sitting in one of those chairs at, at, uh, at convention and I thought to myself, you know, um, Jay Moore in a sense is kind of a, a face of agriculture. Growing up on the farm, I think the kids learn a lot about hard work and respect and responsibility. And, and where our food comes from, and that's very important. I used to teach high school, and I had a student who thought that peaches came out of a can. And so, you know, we're, so many people are so disconnected from the farm. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of Jay Moore and the educational part that they do to educate the community and the public about where your food comes from.
Now here's a reminder, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's show, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And of course, once you're done watching all those informative stories, just keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page we have set up for you. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, Feel free to send us a message either on Facebook or at the address listed below. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Attendees can expect a revamped look at the upcoming American Farm Bureau Convention January 11th through the 14th. And don't worry, these changes are said to be for the better and most importantly, they are made for you. The American farmer, Michael Clements, has details. John Hawkins is Senior Director of Conventions and Events for AFBF. Hawkins says the upcoming convention will be totally different than from years past, starting with the name. The AFBF Annual Convention and Idea Ag Trade Show. We've now dedicated each day of the convention to focus on one entity. Friday and Saturday are pre-convention events. So on Friday, we're going to focus on the Farm Bureau leaders. On Saturday, we're going to focus on commerce. Sunday starts the convention. We're going to focus on the Farm Bureau member. And then on Monday, we're going to focus on the State Farm Bureau. This year's educational sessions will focus on six major areas. Innovation, investment, engagement, infrastructure, leadership, and advocacy. We've offered sessions in leadership and advocacy before. We've never really offered the sessions on innovation and investment. Our Farm Bureau members and leaders are really on the cutting edge of technology. And so what we're going to do is focus on bringing them in and teaching everyone what they're actually doing. Hawkins says AFBF is offering more ways to register for this year's conference. We are opening registration up to the individual Farm Bureau member. You can still go through your state Farm Bureau and register. There will also be links on our website. What we're really excited about is that we are now able to open registration to non-Farm Bureau members. Granted, that's Saturday only for the Commerce Day, but it opens it up so that non-Farm members can see what Farm Bureau actually has to offer. Mark your calendar for the 2015 Annual Convention January 11th through the 14th in San Diego, California. Register online at annualconvention.fb.org. Michael Clements, Washington. Well, when we come back, is it a bird, is it a plane, or is it a small dog with wings? No, believe it or not, folks, that is a bat. And according to the U.S. Forest Service, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Why? The answer when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Tennessee will harvest a relatively small but solid cotton crop this year. Farmers look for good yields after all the puffy white is picked. But inevitably, along the way from planting to harvest, issues arise. We've seen a slow march up uh, from, from the Gulf Coast uh, up, up in this direction. Dr. Tyson Raper is a cotton specialist with UT Ag Research. He's monitoring a new plant disease starting to emerge in Tennessee called target spot. There are examples in this experimental field at the UT Ag Research Center in Jackson. Here both leaves exhibit target spot and the leaf on the upper right shows how quickly this can spread. We, we noticed this first last year on the station and, and this year we're seeing it more widespread. We're seeing a lot more uh, lesions on the leaves and we're seeing a lot more defoliation this year. Cotton grows best when it's really hot and humid. Unfortunately, target spot is a heat and moisture related disease. And more cruel irony here, the higher a farmer's yields, the higher their losses. Another concern, cold weather can sometimes curb plant diseases, but perhaps not so with target spot. And also the winters, we're not sure how the cold winters here in Tennessee will affect the pathogen, but um, all we can say is last year we did have it at a much lower level. We had a very severe winter and we still do have it again. But UT's cotton experts are quick to point out there's no need for panic among cotton producers. They don't believe target spot will affect yields too much because of the timing of when it appears. We don't suspect it's going to be a very big problem for producers, uh, given that it comes in so late during the growing season when we're typically trying to defoliate uh, anyway. UT experts are testing a fungicide called Headline at different application intervals to see how it might do against target spot and plan to expand their research next year to include additional rescue treatments. 
while the disease hasn't had a huge impact yet, they want to get on this issue now. This is Chuck Denny reporting. Thank you, Chuck. Great job as always. Now, welcome back to the Georgia Farm Monitor. While it takes landowners the better part of two decades to make money off timber, tree stands can start generating money well before that, thanks to a growing demand for pine straw. Yeah, David Jones takes a look at why more people are getting into the market and what they can do to make their product more desirable. Just take a drive around any neighborhood and you're likely to see plant beds full of this stuff. And that's good news for landowners looking to get into the timber business as the demand for pine straw has seen a sharp increase over the past decade. Uh, in 2000, the first estimate, the first year that it was estimated uh, was 15 and a half million. It peaked out in about nine, 2009 and 10, eight, nine and 10, uh, at about $80 million a year paid to landowners. With those kind of numbers, it's no wonder why more people are looking to get into pine straw as a viable option to make money off of their land. And best of all, they can do this while waiting for their timber to mature. It, it really fits into a situation where we can start raking some stands as early as age 8, more commonly around age 10, and rake on up until we have to thin the stand. Uh, and so it, it's a, an early income producer for uh, many properties and works out very well. And of course, those dollars are quite attractive when you can generate them early in the rotation as well. However, it does take work to produce high quality pine straw that the consumers want. And the best way to do that is simply keeping the land as clean and well maintained as possible. What most straw producers are looking for are clean straw and that translates into what the, the consumer wants. They don't want weeds, uh, pine cones, sticks, briars, things like that. So trying to keep those stands as clean as possible from competition uh, that also helps the stand grow better when you don't have other competing vegetation out there speaking of invasive plants things like japanese climbing fern and kogon grass can affect the farmer's ability to rate their stands properly but with a little preventative care early in the process those problems can be minimized while also promoting healthy growth for their trees anything you can do to keep that stand clean is really a benefit and we can do that with several techniques of manually removing things. Uh, in some cases we can use herbicides, particularly at younger years, to keep those plants from becoming established so that when we get to the point where we want to rake the stand, uh, we really don't have to do a whole lot other than maybe clean up some sticks and pine cones. That's the ideal situation. Other management tools like uh, herbicide use is very beneficial and it helps not only uh, making a site uh, attractive for pine straw because it's very clean but also there's benefit on the wood side too, extra growth because now uh, the nutrients and, and water that are present are going to your crop trees and not to a bunch of understory, uh, in many cases unusable um, wildlife plants. As for those people looking to get into the pine straw business, Dickens' first word of advice is to make sure there's a local demand for your product. So I said, before you start all this work to get a stand attractive to rake, you want to make sure there's markets for the basically contractors that are willing to buy your straw. You'd hate to do uh, a lot of work and then there's nobody interested in your straw. Reporting from Statesboro, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, finally today, for whatever reason, bats get a bad rap, and that's not the baseball bats. They have a tendency to scare a lot of people. Yeah, understanding, especially if you've ever come across one of these, the African fruit bat or mega bat, wow. which has a wingspan of five and a half feet. But despite their appearance, bats are great for the environment and great pollinators, meaning they help plants grow and they eat a lot of bugs. That's why the U.S. Forest Service is working to protect and expand bat habitat and educate the public about not harming bats. We're also working to get some of those mine areas and those areas of cave that might still be open to the public into a state where people know and respect the cave and maybe stay away from it or stay out of it in those times of year, especially when bats are needing to hibernate in there. The bats throughout the United States consume so many moths and beetles that we estimate U.S. farmers benefiting at least $3 billion annually in insect control. You know, I, I'm going to take his word for it. Yes. You don't actually need to hear from the bat itself. You can just stay there in Africa. Amazing. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Now, here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and this Farm Monitor show.
be nice to bats. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week, everybody.